everyone. Welcome and thank you for joining us for the day one of the international webinar on international student mobility and its implications on ethics. I am Rajula, the program executive of Globethicsnet India, which is an international forum committed to ethics in higher education. This webinar is a joint effort of the Department of English of Scott Christian College, Nagarkoil, that is in the southern tip of India, Globethicsnet India, based in Bangalore, and the Journal of Dharma, based in Bangalore, India. We are excited to host this international webinar today. Just a little housekeeping before we get started. This international webinar will be recorded and a video of it will be available on the Globethicsnet website for you to watch and share. During today's deliberations, only the speakers and paper presenters will be visible on the screen, but you as a participant can use the chat box for your questions, comments, and observations, and it will be seen by everyone and recorded as part of the meeting. You are encouraged to introduce yourself, to share your ideas, and to ask your questions. There will be a short time allotted for discussion at the end of each session and also after the summing up address. We will ask our speakers to address as many of the questions oh. put in the chat box as possible. The report of this program will be uploaded on the Global Net website. And again, today's webinar will be available online on our Global Net website. Ms. Christine Housel, who is a speaker on day two, will throw more light on this tomorrow. The Globethicsnet head office Geneva team is providing support and technical assistance to this international webinar. At this point of time, let me welcome Dr. Dinakar Lal, former professor, Scott Christian College and former director, Ipache, the model of this international webinar. I request him to take over the webinar floor. Sir, please unmute and speak. I'm sorry. Good afternoon, my dear friends, and a warm welcome to the international webinar on international student mobility and its implications on ethics. I'm Jay Dinakarlal, and on behalf of the Department of English and the Center for Research, Scott Christian College, and Globe Ethics Net India and the Journal of Dharma, I extend a very warm welcome to all of you. We appreciate your taking time off your busy schedules to join us in this important event. Over to Dr. Sidney Shirley, the coordinator of the webinar. Good afternoon from India. This international webinar is bringing together people from academic circles, faculty, academic administrators, curriculum designers, research scholars, and po education policy makers from across the globe. This webinar provides a great opportunity for participants to get to know recent knowledge and experience, research findings and experiences to discuss the issues faced by international students opting for international education with a focus on ethics. We hope you will find the program fruitful and engaging. We will end the webinar at 4.15 p.m. I'm sure it's going to be a great two and a quarter hours of interaction and learning for all of us. Over to Dr. Susan. Good afternoon, everybody, dear participants. It's my privilege to introduce the inaugural speaker, Dr. Clint Slay Bryan, Director of the Postgraduate Theology and Development Program and Senior Lecturer in Theology and Development within the School of Religion, Philosophy and Classics at the University of KwaZulu, Natal, South Africa. Having conducted studies at Cornerstone Christian College, University of South Africa, University of the Western Cape, Fuller Theological Seminary and Stellenbosch University, Dr. Clint has served in various institutions, including Pat Kelly Bible College, 
Cornerstone Christian College, Stellenbosch University, and Eastern University. His major area of expertise revolves around public theology, economics, ethics, theology of work, ethical leadership, Kairos theologies, and the role of the church in development discourse and practice. In addition to the publication of many popular and scholarly articles, he has co-edited two books. May we, love, may we now listen to the inaugural address by Dr. Clint. Over to you, sir. Thank you very much to uh, the organizers for this very important webinar uh, around international student mobility and its implications on ethics. The question I want to present to us today is how do we promote the dignity, development and success of international students today in the quest for a more responsible society? That's such an important question. It's such a relevant question and it's a challenging question. But why is this question so important, relevant and challenging? It reminds me of the story that took place in Durban, South Africa, where I'm based, and of all places at a local bar. The conversation amongst three men shifted to the subject of coincidences. The first man said, let me tell you something interesting. One day, my wife was reading a tale of two cities, and guess what happened? We gave birth to twins. The second man remarked, that's funny, because one day my wife was reading The Three Musketeers, and you won't believe what happened. We gave birth to triplets. And then suddenly the third man jumped up and shouted, oh no, I have to rush home now, because when I left the house this morning, my wife was reading Alibaba and the 40 Thieves. The question before us today is no coincidence. It is an intentional, calculated, considered question of utmost importance. It has implications, ramifications, and impact. But with no guarantee whether these will strengthen or soften our ethical responsibility in relation to international student mobility. So let's reflect why. Now in the mid 90s, I embarked on graduate studies in Los Angeles, USA. And I know full well what it means to be an international student. To be an international student from Africa. To be an international student from Africa who faced what the feminist philosopher Iris Young referred to as the five faces of oppression, namely marginalization, exploitation, powerlessness, and a culture of silencing, cultural imperialism, and violence. To be an international student from Africa who didn't have a dramatic African story of moving from darkness to light that could secure me meaningful financial scholarships or assistance. To be an international student from South Africa whose college lecturers inspired my ambition to venture to the US graduate school. But when it came to me applying, making the decision uh, to go there, I was opposed at an emotional and vocational level. The very same principal who inspired me told me to my face, you'll never make it. I know what it means to be an international student from South Africa who was initially quite disappointed with the curriculum, the course content, the methodology and quality of teaching by professors at a prestigious renowned institution. Where during the greater part of my degree, I was covering content that I had already covered during the college years at several institutions in my home country, South Africa. To be an international student from the global South who could only find on-campus employment through the most undesirable jobs, while other students somehow 
typically found employment in much more luxurious settings. I had to create my own jobs and all five of them together took up more time than the actual studies itself and were far from enough to sustain me for my educational and living expenses. To be an international student with significant expertise, but with little or no recognition of the contribution we make to the dignity, development and success of the institution. I also know full well what it means to be an international student with special friends, relationships, colleagues from the institution, beyond the institution and country. And some of these relationships continue to this very day. I also know what it is to be an international student who can make a difference in the lives of others, who can make a responsible impact on the local church and community, who can fulfill leadership roles in the institution, church and community, and who can even make a policy impact within the institution when an injustice exists. So being an international student means that you experience life with all its ambiguities in overlapping, but also really different ways within the international community. For me, during the first 24 years of my life, it was the most challenging experience of life and ministry at that time as a 24 year old. And now, 24 years later, I can tell you categorically that it was the best decision and most profound experience for my life, work and service. And there are no regrets. But I also know as a professor in the higher education sector in South Africa today, for over the past 26 years, I regularly engage with the International Student Committee, a student community where they face administrative violence, they face political violence and infighting, they face xenophobic attacks, they face frustration and performance anxiety. And I also know they experience the gift of being part of a diverse community, a gifted community who have something to offer us in our institution and our program of theology and development. And so that's why we asked this question at the outset of this international webinar. It matters because we know what it means to be an international student, especially from the global south, and especially during this precarious time during COVID-19. And it's these existential and contextual realities that must be our point of departure if we are serious about strengthening the ethical basis surrounding international student mobility at a time such as this. Because we can only respond and be responsive in the quest for a more responsible society if we are grounded in everyday experiences and contexts of our international student community. So we look forward to gaining deeper insight into these dynamics during the plenary and parallel sessions. And I'm glad that this webinar takes place in the context of India, as we think of this key value within the global ethics uh, network of making visible and audible the voices of those that we don't typically hear or who are silenced. And in this case, we're focusing on international students. So again, how do we promote the dignity, development and success of international students today in the quest for a more responsible society? How do we do this? There's the story of Albert Einstein, who was making the rounds of the speaker's circuit. But to be honest, Einstein preferred more the thought of getting back to his laboratory work. He was wondering how he might devise a strategy to resolve this problem. And so one night Einstein and his driver 
we're heading to yet another rubber chicken dinner. And since his driver somewhat resembled him in looks and manner, Einstein mentioned to his chauffeur that he was really tired of speech making. At which time his chauffeur said, I have an idea, boss. I've heard you give this speech so many times. I'll bet I could give it for you. Einstein laughed and then he said, sure, why not? Let's do it. Well, they arrived at the dinner. And so Einstein donned the chauffeur's cap and jacket and took a seat at the back of the room while the chauffeur took to the front to speak. And you won't believe it, but the chauffeur of his actually gave a beautiful rendition of Einstein's speech and even answered a few questions expertly. But then a supremely pompous professor asked an extremely complicated question to let everyone know how smart he was. At which time, without missing a beat, the chauffeur fixed the pompous professor with a steely stare and exclaimed, Sir, I must say, the answer to that question is in fact so simple that, that I'm sure even my dear chauffeur sitting at the back could answer it for me. Einstein resolved his challenging question by crafting a strategic action plan and it dependent, depended on working together. How they work together would make all the difference. Einstein would accomplish what he desired, but he demanded synergy. And so the key point of promoting the dignity, development and success of our international students today in the quest for a more responsible society demands nothing less than fresh, creative, strategic modes of collective engagement as faculty, academic administrators, curriculum designers, educational policy makers, and research scholars. In other words, we can no longer work in silos and in competitive and fragmented ways. This international webinar, I believe, has convening power. It brings together a diverse group of critical role players who otherwise might not be in the same reflective and dialogical space. So we'll be grappling together with the theme and its sub themes, and we have an opportunity to explore and craft a more collective mode of engagement. And what brings us together now is the significance of this moment in time. We are, to use a Greek word, in a Kairos moment, which is different from a Kronos moment. Kronos has to do with clock time, time as we know it, chronological time. Kairos time is about a special moment, an opportune time, an unusual time, a pregnant moment that might give birth to a life or death international community. A moment of revelation, of opportunity or judgment, depending on when and how we respond. And based on how we respond in this significant moment, today, year and now, will show us up for who we really are and what we're really about. And so part of that collective engagement is discerning the signs of the times and to do it together and to promote a strategic course of action. That's precisely the gift and the responsibility before us during this international webinar, to mutually discern a course of action that promotes the dignity, development and success of international students today, here and now, in the quest for a more responsible society. And so finally, we're left with the question, so what's the plan? How do we promote the dignity, development and success 
of international students today in the quest for a more responsible society. And so moving forward, let me encourage you to embrace or wear a set of lenses that might assist us with the tasks at hand. These are four to six responsibility lenses that I will highlight if we have the time to help us explore how to promote this responsibility. Now, when we wear any of these lenses, it helps us to see what action is required of us as, as faculty, academic administrators and various role players. It's a framework that helps provide us with an opportunity to affirm what we are doing, to be critical about what we are doing, but to also strengthen our ethical impact. The first lens we could call the prophetic responsibility lens. When we meet together wearing this lens, we employ the familiar language of criticizing, confronting, challenging, and judging, because the current situation of international students today may conflict with the picture of reality we dream about and aspire to. We want to get to the root of the problems. And whilst wearing this critical lens, which can often leave us feeling pessimistic and overwhelmed, we want to offer a new vision, something different, a more responsive engagement with international student mobility issues towards a more responsible society. And it's this vision and this dream that will energize us and motivate us to advance the ethical cause. So during our webinar, be on the lookout for speakers and discussions wearing this lens. And please participate by putting on this lens around every issue being discussed, the prophetic responsibility lens. The second lens, the narrative responsibility lens. When we meet together wearing this lens, we engage in storytelling and listening. We share stories which move and inspire us, which provide identity, portray ethos, shape character, and which embody a vision and build a community. We tell stories about people, about role models. We give examples. These are stories that bring virtue and values to life. So during the webinar, be on the lookout for speeches and discussions where this lens is being worn. And please participate by putting on this lens. Stories of hopelessness and of hope by international students are necessary. And stories of challenges as well as of accomplishments amongst us as role players are crucial. The third lens is the policy responsibility lens. When we meet together wearing this lens, we engage with people in positions of responsibility people with power, people who actually take the decisions that influence the lives of millions. This webinar offers us this platform in a very deliberate way. We cannot just be critiquing and dreaming. We cannot just be listening to stories. We also have to be participating collectively and responsively with critical role players in higher education. In the international student mobility realm and in the public sphere at large. So be on the lookout for this lens and participate by engaging these influential role players around the challenges, vision, experiences and stories and regarding the decisions, the policies, the institutional frameworks, the processes and the practices needed to advance the dignity development and success of our international students today in the quest for a more responsible society. And so finally, the fourth lens, the technical responsibility lens. When we meet together wearing this lens, as we are doing right now, we engage in scholarly responsibilities and tasks to promote the dignity development and success of international students. We analyze and clarify, we deal with conceptual and philosophical questions, 
and we ask questions of meaning and of logic. We do the research, we do the reading, we do the studying, we do the analysis, we do the debating, we do the reflecting. It helps us to understand what is going on, why it is going on, what ought to be going on, and how we might respond. And let me say it's hard work, but this technical work is non-negotiable. We need to understand trends. We need to understand issues in the international student mobility realm. We need definitions. We need to interrogate current ideologies and practices within institutions of higher education. And we need to apply our minds very seriously to more responsive collective engagement. There is no room for lazy activists. There is no room for lazy analysts. There is no room for lazy role players. If you're a faculty member, academic administrator, curriculum designer, educational policy maker, or research scholar, and you are not reading, learning, dialoguing, and reflecting, you are actually enabling the perpetuation but the perpetuation and reproduction of life-denying visions, values, and practices that harm the international community today. So be on the lookout and appreciate this dialogical space to listen and learn and apply your mind. And so to end in my last minute, I end with a story of a teenager who had hurt her finger and was needing help. She went to the building and there were two doors marked physical and mental. She went in the physical door. Inside that were two doors marked bone and muscle. She went in the bone door. And inside that were two doors, surgery and therapy. So she went in the surgery door. And inside that were two other doors, major and minor and she went in the minor door, only to find herself outside again. And then someone came to her and said, did they not help you in there? No, she replied, but wow, that was the most organized place I've ever seen. When people participating in this webinar leave here after two, these two days, will they leave here saying, wow, that was the most organized and sophisticated webinar we were part of, but maybe it did not help us. Or will they leave saying, wow, this helped me to be more responsive as a key role player to advance the dignity, development and success of international students here and now, today, towards a more responsible society. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Clint, for those deep thoughts. There is a question in the chat box, and this is from uh, Mr. Sami, who is working in the Bahir Dar University. So he has put across his opinion that it's better to prepare a family for the international students who can mentor the situation in the university and the country culture. So he's asking, what do you think over this idea? Over to you, Dr. Clint. Yes, I think that is part of, thanks for that question, those comments. I think that is part of this collective engagement that we need because we also need to move beyond the formal uh, role players in the public sphere such as those uh, on this call uh, participating in this webinar, we need to find ways of uh, connecting uh, and working together with, uh, with communities, ordinary communities, everyday people, uh, people within the civil society space, people uh, within the family context. Uh, and that's part of the challenge uh, I think this webinar is uh, presenting for us to find fresh creative ways and strategic ways of uh, acting in a collective and more responsive, uh, responsive way 
in terms of our international student community. Thank you, sir. Our heartfelt gratitude for your valuable and thought-provoking words of wisdom. We feel blessed with your motivation address. Thank you, Dr. Clint, once again. And now over to Ms. Rajan. Unmute, uh, Ratula. Respected participants, I deem it as a pleasure and honor to introduce Reverend Professor Dr. Dr. H.C. Christoph Stuckelberger, who is the founder and president of the Global Network on Ethics, Global Ethics Net Foundation, that is based in Geneva, Switzerland. He is also the executive director of Geneva Agape Foundation in Geneva itself. He is Professor Emerit Tuva of Ethics at the University of Basel, visiting professor of ethics at universities in Leeds, UK, Moscow, Russia, Enugu, Nigeria, Beijing, China. He served for a long time as director of the development organization Bread for All in Swiss advisory commissions on international development and on bioethics. He is in boards of ethics funds, active in Faith Invest, ethics advisor for the United Nations Scaling Up Nutrition Program, SUN. He largely published on business ethics, finance ethics, development and environment. May we now listen to his talk on cultural differences and the campus experience of international students and ethical overview. Over to Dr. Christoph Stuckelberger now. Thank you very much, uh, Rachula, for this kind of introduction. Um, and thank you for organizing this uh, webinar. Um, I see Chesney also as the timekeeper. Thank you so much. And uh, let me uh, start with a little joke. This uh, Swiss watch, you know, is famous Swiss watch for being uh, on time. But uh, Chesney is the better watch uh, key, uh, timekeeper. Thank you. And uh, the more the Indians become um, precise like a Swiss watch, the less uh, the Swiss do it because they say the others are doing it now, we don't need. So that's just a, a joke. No, uh, let me uh, summarize maybe with two points uh, before I come to my uh, four uh, items. One is uh, when we talk about mobility, I suggest to replace it by mobility slash exposure, because you will see what I will say, exposure is larger than mobility. The second is the term campus. Let's also enlarge the term campus uh, beyond an, a university campus, because exposure goes to other types of campuses. So that's what I want to share in four points. The first is, uh, geographical and historical examples. The second is uh, a bit a systematic way of uh, types of mobility or exposure. The third is about dimensions of exposure. And the fourth is about values and virtues. Now, my first point, if I look at students um, in the history of humankind, they were not always called students, they were disciples. And disciples, of course, first of all, in the religious term. You in India have a long uh, history of uh, gurus with disciples. Um, and uh, the, the, the monks in the monasteries were disciples. The guru followers were disciples. I uh, remember a very impressive three days I passed in uh, Jaipur, um, some years back in the headquarter of the Jain community. And I shared with the uh, with head master of uh, the, the Jain uh, and, and their disciples three days of, of learning. That was a mobility and exposure uh, first class, so to say. If you look at so Socrates, his students sitting around him, if you look at Confucius, if you look at the rabbi tradition in, in uh, the Jewish 
uh, if you look at Jesus and his 12 disciples, if you look at Muhammad, all these religious leaders are um, leaders who are teachers, see, seen also as teachers, and the students are disciples. So that's a holistic view. And I think when we look at today's students' mobility, we should not forget to reflect that. Um, my second example um, in this first point of examples, um, mobility depends on technical and material means of a, of a, of a period. My grandfather was a, was a pastor uh, and uh, his mobility at that time, 110 years ago, 1910, his exposure went from Basel to Tübingen, just 50 kilometers from Basel in South Germany. That was his exposure and was, that was already a, a, a huge mobility at that time. Today, we would say that's not mobility, that's neighborhood. But at that time it was. Uh, the third example of um, uh, my father was also a pastor and a theological student during Second World War. So he was in lockdown for six years. These whole studies, he could not uh, leave the country because of Second World War. So what is the exposure and mobility? His mobility was, and he was proud to have one semester uh, from Basel to Zurich. That's again about 50 or 70 kilometers. That's his own mobility. So mobility depends on the time. But what impressed me always with me, my father is they were, it was a generation of very, very strong theologians. Why? Because they, the lockdown helped them to, I mean, I say lockdown, it was the, the prison, of, prison of Switzerland as in the center of Europe, you know, closed frontiers, but they learned to go deep into theology, deep into faith. And um, I have a letter at home from him, 1941. He was a student uh, of Karl Barth. And at the same time, he had to go to military. So six of the three of the six years, he was in army, no choice. And um, and what he did, he gave a speech in his uh, company in the army and uh, his unit and uh, about the concentration camps in Germany. I said, how do you know in 41 when it was still denied by majority of people, you as a young student of theology told me, of course, Karl Barth knew it uh, through Bonhoeffer in Germany. So you see, even if you are in lockdown, you can have a, an enlightenment and a clarity of thoughts that we are sometimes missing with all the modern um, technology and exposures. So um, mobility is not only about uh, physical, moving your body to another place on, on earth. My uh, next example is my own, if I look what trained me and gave me sensitivity. In my primary school time, I grew up in a small uh, farmer's village in Switzerland. My father was pastor there, but uh, we had a majority of my classmates were farmer's children. And one came every morning, um, very much smelling from the cow uh, he had to to, to uh, clean in the morning before going to school. And nobody wanted to sit beside his, this, uh, this boy. I told him at home and my father immediately said, of course, that's your choice, uh, that's your uh, role. You have to sit beside this smelling uh, farmer's boy. Of course I did it uh, uh, as, a, as a small uh, primary school child. So that was my exposure to to, to care for the needy. Compassion as a value is not a, a theory. It was my father who told me, please, you sit beside this smelling cow boy, so to say, a uh, farmer's child. Um, I take another example from my studies. When we go, went to, uh, with students mobility, normally one or two semesters to study abroad, the, the majority of my colleagues went to uh, Princeton or to Edinburgh in uh, uh, UK or to Tübingen or to Amsterdam. And I said, I go to Nairobi. And everybody looked at me and said, are you crazy? 
uh, what do you want to learn there? You go to a reputation uh, university. No, Nairobi, you can learn nothing. I said I have a, an intuition that I will learn more in Nairobi than in Tübingen. Because in Tübingen and Edinburgh, it's more of the same. But I want to have an exposure to see what, how Christianity, what Christianity means in another cultural context. So I jump out of my culture and swim in another culture. And that was the best exposure. And I can even say we would not be together here today, I think, if I was not in Nairobi in a theological uh, seminary in 1974, 75. Why? Because it learned me intercultural connectivity, the, the, the need for respect for each other and the, the idea of a global network on ethics had one of its roots in this 1974 exposure. Today, we would call it mobility. I take another example. In 1979, I uh, was in, um, in, in India. I met uh, my friend, student friend, um, uh, Jacob Belli, who is still together with uh, uh, Global Ethics Net India. He was a pastor in, in uh, in uh, close to Coimbatore, and uh, I I went to Madurai Seminary, and what impressed me that's another exposure. What impressed me uh, impressed me most. I don't know much again of what was talking, but what impressed me is they had a chapel outside in the free space. It was uh, an outside uh, prayer uh, space. And the chapel inside the seminary had no walls because it's a, it's a warm temperature. So the wind came in and out in this chapel. So you see an exposure in another way. It's not only about teaching, it's about learning uh, experiences outside, out of the box. So these are just a few examples of, of how I try to understand mobility as exposure and expanding experience of, uh, in a Christian term, we would say experience of the beauty of God's world and diversity. That leads me to my second point to systematize a bit types of mobility and exposure. There is the horizontal one. Uh, we could call it horizontal mobility, the geographical. Yeah, you, you go to another country, you st uh, from South Africa to US, that's very important. And that's, uh, that's uh, still needed and of course is, uh, is limited now during COVID. Uh, but as I learned from my father, even during COVID or even during a lockdown, uh, we can have a lot of exposures to explore. The second mobility uh, is the academic mobility. That means transdisciplinary to jump out of the box of the own discipline and to learn from other disciplines. Transdisciplinary mobility can be done from home, can be done on the screen, can be done through reading. So we should teach or we should uh, encourage uh, students not only to look at geographical mobility, but also the academic transdisciplinary uh, mobility. The third is the social one. And in my view, that's one of the most important. I see students, even my own students, some of them have never left their own classes, their own uh, uh, level of uh, middle class or whatever they are. But mobility means to jump into from uh, through the levels uh, of classes and, and of, of, uh, of, of uh, types in the society. I tried also when I was director of uh, Bread for All these development organizations, I tried to sleep on the floor of, uh, of uh, in, in, in projects, not just always jumping from one hotel room to another one. That's not exposure and that's not mobility. Um, when I was in Nairobi, one of my profound experiences, I was with my student colleague over Christmas in his home. Home. It was this uh, simple African hut, you know, with a straw roof and uh, with a firewood in the hut. And I was sleeping on a very shabby bed with the chicken 
about, uh, below my bed and the sick grandfather uh, on the floor in the same small four square or six square meter hut. I will never forget that. That is exposure in the social time uh, term, social exposure. But then um, three days later, I was at the embassy of Switzerland in Nairobi. I was on the, on the high class and I don't dare to meet billionaires and millionaires. I want to be exposed to their thinking. I'm just uh, in contact right now with a young 30 years old billionaire in Singapore. You imagine a 30 years old who is already a billionaire. I want to understand what is, is in the mindset of such a young person who is with 30 years already a billionaire. Uh, from her own earnings and not from the father's earnings. So this exposure from the bed with a check, chicken under the bed up to the, the high class and the political, that gives us the possibility to really uh, to learn and to get, get deeper into reality. And that is the fourth uh, mobility, type of mobility is a spiritual one. Um, uh, um, the, the first general secretary of, uh, of the U United Nations, Doug Hammarskjöld, wrote a, a beautiful book, uh, say the, the longest and most important journey uh, you can do is the journey to yourself. And he was this uh, head of UN and at the same time a deep spiritual person. So the spiritual journey and mobility is something we have to encourage people to, to, to go. And that is, of course, the religious journey, uh, journey of mobility to attend services of other religions, to walk in the shoes of the other, as we say, as an, uh, an important attitude. Uh, so, and uh, there I learned a lot in India, but also other continents, but you in India may be more advanced than other uh, countries and cultures in order to be exposed to this interfaith uh, mobility. That leads me to my third point, um, and I will make it in 29 minutes, uh, be assured, uh, is uh, the dimensions of mobility in, and exposure. And I, I come to uh, some, uh, again, uh, about five uh, aspects. The first is speed. Speed or slowliness. I think when we speak about mobility, uh, we have to reflect of what kind of uh, speed do we have. Sometimes we need to have high speed. We go with a fast uh, train or airplane to another place. We stay there for one day and we go ahead. But slowliness sometimes is more important or as important. And I'm self-critical because I'm a speedy person and not a slow person. But uh, to, to say, okay, I stay in an ashram for one week and I don't move and I, I uh, exposure means stability as the monks knew, stabilitas loci, uh, the stability of the place is the, 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 the wealth I have as a monk. And um, this stability uh, is also mobility. It's another way of mobility. It's a precondition even for spiritual mobility. The second dimension is place. So the, the place of course play, plays a role. What kind of environment? But if I'm moving uh, from um, a well uh, organized um, uh, student room in the campus in Bangalore uh, to a well organized student room in the campus of uh, Princeton, that's already very good, but better and more uh, exposure is if you go to another place which is not as well organized or which is really making a difference. The, the third dimension of mobility and exposure is of course the one which is closest to us today, the virtual vir versus real. The cyberspace offers a lot of exposure even though uh, it has its limits. I cannot embrace you uh, on the screen. I cannot uh, give you the hand on the screen and I'm missing this kind of emotional um, exposure, 
but uh, we have other ways of uh, online exposures. It's lovely within two hours, three hours to see all of you. Uh, that's an exposure, which is a, a real chance we have with a virtual uh, world. So we, we have to reflect mobility in, uh, in, in the real world or in the virtual world. Where do we use which uh, way? And the, the, the fifth dimension of, uh, um, of, uh, of mobility, what I already said, the, the, the alert mode, the awareness, the higher awareness versus the normal. So if we, prayer is a form of mobility, you, you go away from your normal status into another sphere of communication. And uh, those who are, have spiritual uh, depth, they, are, they know how to show us the way. And, and that's uh, uh, this other dimension of, uh, yeah. Now, what I think is, is very important is, uh, we could be lost in diversity. And I know that many students fear mobility because they fear to lose themselves. They are then so confused and they say, I cannot digest all these impressions. So I rather stay in my box. So it needs already a strong character. And of course, everybody has to decide what level of exposure I can I digest. Um, and digesting mobility and uh, exposure is possible when, or is better possible if we have a center. We have our belly and we have, um, we act out of the center. For me, a dancer is always an example. I, I wonder why do they not fall down when they turn like that? I would fall down, but they told me they do not fall down because their center is stable. Huh? their belly is stable, and then you can act with your hands and feet like Shiva uh, uh, all around. Uh, you, can, uh, you, you, you are mobile as long as your center is stable. I had the, exp the, the chance to have a stable faith, of course, with all the doubts everybody has, but a stable faith allowed me to be so open to exposures everywhere because then exposure is not a threat to my identity, but it's an enrichment. Now I end with uh, my uh, fourth point. What are then the values and virtues which could lead to this kind of uh, openness and, uh, and uh, openness to exposure and mobility? The first is, and I come back to, to, the, to this uh, book, Glow Balance. You can download it for free. Glow Balance, uh, if you go to globethics.net slash Glow Balance, you find directly the button to, to download it. I published uh, three months ago this, uh, this book on how to balance values which are uh, somehow in contradiction or in tension to each other. And my hypothesis is we need to balance uh, opposites in order to uh, be productive. And I uh, just mentioned a few of them, openness and concentration. You can be more open if you learn to be concentrated and focused. If you are not able to focus, you are lost in your openness. The second, curiosity and respect. Curiosity is a very important virtue. We are curious to discover who is Susan Roy, who is Evangeline, who is Eliana, who is Sunlia Gador. You know, I, I'm curious to learn more from you, even though I only see your face. But uh, this curiosity is key for um, mobility and exposure. But that we have to combine with respect, of course. I don't ask you private things, Sundiak, because uh, that is your privacy. So how to balance openness and, and respect in exposure is very important. And of course, we make mistakes. That's part of the, of the learning. The, the other aspect of values is the balance between security and trust. Exposure is a danger because uh, we, we, ex we are exposed and we are not sure if the other is a 
is a uh, is a thief or is honest and we don't understand the the body language of another culture um i remember my first visit to india in the airport i was i was with my wife i was uh, totally confused because the 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 flight uh, person always made like that i said oh he says no your flight is not going uh, it was in from from uh, Mumbai to Bangalore. He made always like that. I was uh, I was helpless until I my friend Jacob Belli told me this is a yes in India, but for me it's a no. So you see this kind of misunderstanding of culture. That's part of the learning. So security and trust. I need to trust. Now I know if an Indian says like that, that's positive. Uh, so. The, the next one is equality and solidarity. We are equal, gender equality, whatever equality we have in mind, and we need solidarity, but we have to balance this. It's not easy. And uh, the last one, uh, freedom and responsibility. Exposure means we have the freedom. It's a very positive, uh, but also the responsibility not to abuse the freedom uh, of mobility and and exposure. So my conclusion, we have to define key values and virtues in, uh, in uh, mobility, and then it's uh, extremely uh, uh, helpful. And what I would recommend uh, in preparation for today, I thought we need to um, prepare our students. I speak as a teacher. We need to prepare them for the exposure. We just don't say, I give you the address and you go to Princeton or you go to, to Shanghai to, for abroad studies. Let's uh, encourage them really to prepare carefully. What kind of exposure do I want? I'm, am I prepared for it? Am I strong enough for it? So that it's not just a repetition of more of the same, because too many students go abroad and they come back and have just more of the same. And even worse, uh, we know uh, from studies about exposure in tourism that uh, more than 50% of the tourists come back with a confirmation of their prejudices. I travel to South Africa and I, as a tourist, and I come back and say, oh, okay, I know uh, my view of, um, um, of uh, South Africa is confirmed. So we should really try to uh, have self-reflective mode in order not to just have more of the same, but to have a real enrichment in our exposure. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you very much, Professor Christoph. And uh, just for a few questions, the first question is from uh, Mr. Nero Gilbert of Cebu Technological University, Philippines. He asks whether there is an international grievance committee for international students who experience discrimination in the host country. There are a few replies to that, but we would like to get your opinion. Yeah, that's a very, uh, very uh, important question. And if, in fact, I think it could be um, a chance that Globe Ethics Net, we, we help to further uh, take up this question and maybe collect some experiences and even come back to some possibilities. You know, we have the whistleblowing mechanism, for example, for uh, plagiarism issues. Why not having a kind of uh, telephone line or a um, platform where people can share this experience and even get some help? Because with uh, increasing racism and nationalism, uh, this is increasing. And uh, it can be extremely harmful. I know African students in China who face that. Um, we know Chinese facing that in Africa. We know from uh, many cases. So um, I think that's a very good point. And thank you uh, um, asking this question. I would really encourage uh, Globe Ethics Net team <clears throat> and uh, with the regions, Ratula and the other regions, to reflect if it can give some guidance and even uh, a kind of hotline uh, on that. Thank you very much. There's one more question from Miss Joyce of Kenya. And she asks, how can matters of ethics 
be handled in a different culture from your own especially in institutions of higher education i didn't get the first word how can who uh... how can matters of ethics be handled in a different culture especially in institutions of higher education yeah that's a very broad question and of course again at the core of global ethics net because we want to be a global network of ethics which says we have to balance global values and cultural really sensitive implementation adaptation of values and this is the core and i think one is uh, linked to this question of respect and also that we are not speaking on behalf of the others but the others express their values and then it's an exchange it does not mean we accept everything of the other culture we cannot accept the violence against women in india even if some people justify and say that's our culture it's not even if it's your culture it's a, it would be a wrong culture so we we need that but uh, let me share again one experience in nairobi um, i had my lesson my lectures i heard my lectures on on islam uh, in basel university as a student then i went to to nairobi and uh, the first time i i met a muslim you imagine with 25 year, four years old no muslim contact before uh, but of course i knew a lot about islam from my christian teacher but then the teacher of islam in the christian theological seminary was a muslim so that is also an ethics learning you know the 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 muslim tell us about islamic ethics and not the christians interpret and then of course we have a dialogue so maybe that's part of the answer of uh, how to teach ethics in a multicultural or different cultures uh, background thank you professor kristof uh, for gracing this occasion with your valuable presence amidst your very very busy schedule and on behalf of the organizers and the participants here i extend my sincere thanks to you for thank motivating you. and enlightening yes, all of us with your experience and precious knowledge thanks again thank you we keep in touch thank you sure and i hand over the floor to dr susan roy now dear participants uh, it's my pleasure to introduce reverend dr father jos nandikara national director globethics.india reverend father jos is the dean of the faculty of philosophy at dharmaram vidya kshetram and head of the department of philosophy at christ university bangalore he also serves as director of the center for the study of world religions and is the chief editor of the journal of dharma in his interreligious work he is guided by the vedic vision let noble thoughts come from all sides may we now listen to the second talk by dr reverend father jos nandikara on ethical implications on international higher education post covid 19 over to father jos thank you susan for your kind words of welcome thank you professor christof and dr clin for the wonderful presentations with great analysis inspiring thoughts and stories my presentation is titled international higher education and covid 19 ethical interface i'm a student of philosophy and philosophy is a branch of study that ask general and fundamental questions so we begin the question with know thyself and human beings are generally known as homo sapiens we make a distinction between what seems to be the case sense knowledge and what is the case the reality as it is this reflective knowledge is species specific to human beings all human beings think and only human beings think and to the extent that human beings think they become fully human as social beings 
we are learning from our own personal experience as well as from experts. And we are members of the knowledge society. No one is an island. No one can personally verify all the beliefs and truths that they know or they hold. However, we cannot be indifferent to the question whether what we believe is true or not. Knowledge society generates, shares, and makes available to all members of the society knowledge that may be used for the well being of all, to bring justice, solidarity, democracy, peace, and provide universal and equitable access to information. Now, the fundamental dimension of human being is ethics. We have a reflective awareness of good and bad, right and wrong, just and unjust. We make a distinction between what is the case and what ought to be the case. Though we may disagree on what is good and what is bad in many situations, we agree that good is to be done and evil is to be avoided. Ethics is a way of life and judging life. As we are members of the knowledge society, we are also members of an ethical society where we look for the, not only the survival, the evolutionary biological principle, but well-being of all. We are selfish, but more importantly, we are also altruistic. And we express that in terms of the golden rule. One should treat others as one would like others to treat oneself. Or negatively, one should not treat others in ways that would not, one would not like to be treated. We have that ethics of care and we need to emphasize over and above the ethics of utility. Persons are of value independent of their use. And the most vulnerable has ethical priority in all human actions, personal and social. A third element that makes very important our day-to-day -day life, economics, it is fundamental and constitutive of human life and well being. Economics concerns overrule most other aspects of life to such an extent that development is measured exclusively in economic terms. Education, sadly, is a commodity, saleable one. You can buy it. And knowledge is also used for the creation of wealth. And this economics makes us members of a market society, a way of life where market relations, market incentives, and market values come to dominate all aspects of life. And for us, particularly our education and international higher education. A free market is a system in which the prices for goods and services are determined by market where needs are created by market agencies. In a free market, the laws and forces of supply and demand are free from or limited uh, interventions by governments or by other authorities. People are guided by prices rather than by values in the market society. So we are between this knowledge society ethical societies and market societies. The ethical man cannot remain insensitive to the inequalities that persist in the world of homo sapiens and homo economicus. When the world's knowledge and economic wealth is growing impressively, the scandal of inequalities, corruption, New forms of poverty and exploitations are on the increase. 
knowledge society should be guided by ethics and values, not market. We need ethically aligned sustainable societies. Before I begin move to international higher education, let us listen to this young woman, Greta Thunberg. People are suffering, people are dying, entire ecosystems are collapsing. We are in the beginning of mass extinction and all you can talk about is money and fairy tales of eternal economic growth. How dare you? The politics and solutions needed are still nowhere in sight. A response from the international community, which I first heard uh, uh, in a conference in Geneva 2015 on sustainable development, the fourth value on education, which moved me more and more into the realm of ethics. People, we need societies, peace and prosperity for people and planet through partnership. This is the motto that I bring in to in the higher education. Quality education is the fourth one among the 17 sustainable development goals. And 4.3 aims to, by 2030, ensure equal access for all women and men to affordable and quality technical, vocational, and tertiary education, including university. Higher education also forms an important part of other goals related to poverty, health and well being, gender equality, governance, decent work and economic growth, responsible consumption and protection, climate change and peace, justice and strong institutions. Now let me come specifically to education. Most of us are in the field of education and the conferences on ethic on higher education, international student mobility. Shark Talos, he wrote as the chairman of the committee in 1996 on the four pillars of learning, learning to know, that is learning to learn, an ongoing learning process, learning to do, learning to be competent, learning to live together, learning to live ethically, learning to be, learning to be human. With the COVID-19, what happens is we hear, we get the first pillar, learning to know. All the informations are available through online uh, media. However, the rest of them, learning to live ethically together and learning to be human, we need the exposure. An internationally mobile student, as defined by UNESCO, is an individual who has physically crossed an international border between two countries with the objective to participate in educational activities in a destination country, where the destination country is different from his or her country of origin. There are different models. Study abroad is a term given to different programs, usually run through a society, which allows a student to study part of the program abroad. There are also student exchanges in view of internship and volunteer experiences. The mobility is influenced by many factors, including academic excellence, financial capabilities, visa and immigration policies of the country, and work experience during the studies and secure jobs after education. In 2017, there were 5.3 million international students and more than half of them were enrolled in six countries, America, US, United Kingdom, Australia, France, Germany, and Russia. And most students were sent from China, India, Germany, 
Republic of Korea, Nigeria, France, and Saudi Arabia. Now, in these countries, US, UK, Australia, the, these universities are becoming more and more diverse. And through immigration and number of other reasons, even the local students are more diverse and giving us an opportunity to live together. International students account for 27 percentage in Australia, 19 percentage in UK and US of the total number of tertiary level students. International students are on the rise. There are multiple reasons for choosing to study abroad. And Professor Christophe suggested some of the reasons in a very positive way, how those transitions, how that mobility and exposure would help us to increase employability in the home labor market, inability to find relevant study opportunities at home, and the desire for migration. The motivations of countries and universities recruiting international students are equally complex and increasingly commercial. Both sending and receiving countries hope to benefit from this growing pool of skilled human capital. There are win-win situations. Host countries are eager to build their own research capacities, seek international talent. Of course, there is a brain drain. Developing countries of their best talent, depriving countries of their best talent, but there is also a brain gain by creating a global pool of highly skilled human capital. As scientists and researchers, they are forming knowledge networks and increasing collaboration on global policy issues. During the COVID-19 also, the scientists, researchers, and health professionals from governments, international organization, and nonprofit sector work together to find solutions. As the universities themselves are driven by market, global students' exposure is of great importance for countries, academic institutions, and perhaps most crucially for individual students. It creates big business, contributing billions to the global economy. Inter international students are charged unfairly high tuition fees three times to five times in UK, Australia, and in some of the US universities. Many countries and universities depend on international student enrollments as a significant source of income to balance academic budgets and promote higher education. Sadly, there are recruiting agencies in many major cities who work for profit charging 10 to 20 percentage of the first year tuition fees. International higher education is often elitist. Money rather than talent determines admission. As the universities themselves are driven by market, often there are unethical practices and international students are contributing to such practices with their higher fees. Sadly, the students learn the lesson that one could be unethical for profit. Universities often set the tone in society about what is acceptable. They are seen as the benchmark for ethical standards. And historically, their morals have been the starting point for change. Many universities invite and actively recruit new international students to campus now during COVID-19 or post COVID-19 when many of these countries have issued the highest travel warning. And while universities encourage international students to disregard such warnings, they themselves have canceled all the study programs for their own students. Those study abroad provide great opportunities, students and the transitions from teacher-centered, syllabus-driven, exam-oriented pedagogy to learner-centered, outcome-based, and result-oriented Anthropology 
is difficult for many students. Often students of a linguistic, cultural, racist determin discriminations. Cultural integration, though difficult, is as important as curriculum integration. Students struggle between keeping identity and acculturation, being away from home, friends, poor academic results, and financial difficulties contribute to stress, anxiety, loneliness for many students. What happens next? COVID-19 impacts are hitting an education system that was already in crisis at primary, secondary, and tertiary levels. More than 1.5 billion students and youth across the planet are affected by school and university closures due to the COVID-19 outbreak. Many international students were stranded for weeks and months. Some students were forced to return. Many are unable to return to complete their studies and need to pay very high fees, though all the lectures are on online. Despite the uncertainties, studying abroad remains at the top of many students' and parents' plans. COVID-19 has complicated the question of when and how they will make it happen. Many lost their opportunities for this year. Opinions on the importance of COVID-19 for the international higher education vary. The impact will only be temporary, many say. Crisis will change higher education drastically forever, many others. Some convey a sense of fear, uncertainty, and loss, while others express hope, excitement even, about the possibilities opened up by the closing of borders. Born of necessity, the sudden tilt to online learning is rapidly changing our habits and reshaping our thinking. It is provoking a panic gogi in many quarters as faculty and students adjust en masse to the online learning environments at an unprecedented pace. While some students say they are finding the move to online difficult due to a lack of in-person interaction, trouble focusing and staying self-motivated, others are finding it much more effective. Travel restrictions, visa process, finance, and impact on jobs and salaries abroad, all are giving difficult hurdles on the prospective student. As the coronavirus continues, it is becoming increasingly clear that this is a challenge that will be a fixture in our lives for some time to come. At home, pedagogies may risk the perception that global problems can be solved in the comforts of one's own home. The third and fourth pillar of education, learning to live together sustainably and learning to be human will suffer without the actual encounter and lived experiences. Globalization could move to nationalism and tribalism, which was also seen during the pandemic. What we need is globalization with an emphasis on sustainability. We need inclusive and equitable education to decrease the ever increasing divides. We need to develop sensitivity and solidarity. The fragile world of system, the fragility of the world system in the face of the pandemic has demonstrated that not everything can be resolved by market. We need to develop this awareness that today either we are all saved or no one is. Poverty, decadence, the sufferings of one place on earth are a silent breeding ground for problems that will eventually affect the whole planet. If we are concerned about the disappearance of some species, we should be obsessed that everywhere there are 
people and peoples who do not develop their potential and their own beauty because of poverty and other structural limits, because that ends up impoverishing us all. I would conclude with suggesting what Globetics Net does. Many to build peace and prosperity for people and planet through partnership. I hope next tomorrow, Christian will give more details. We develop ethics in higher education for students, teachers, professions, and institutions. There are different programs and resources. Joining the Globe Ethics Net, we would find, and there is a new move to have the ethical standards. Now, the institutions are ranked as triple A or with our NAC A plus. Now, how we would rate ourselves and other agencies like Globe Ethics Net would rate our institutions with ethics, environment, and education. We shall commit ourselves to change the grim picture of our world by world as described by Chris Hedges. We now live in a nation where doctors destroy health, lawyers destroy justice, universities destroy knowledge, press destroys information, religion destroys morals, and banks destroy economy. And I share and invite all of you to share the hope and prayer of Pope Francis. May your research, our research, benefit all, so that peoples of earth will be fed, given to drink, healed and educated. May political life and economy of peoples receive from you, from us, indications on how to advance with greater certainty towards the common good for the benefit, especially of the poor and those in need and towards respect for our planet. The universal rights we proclaim must become reality for all. COVID-19 is a promise for change. Thank you. Thank you very much, Father. There were some questions in the question and answer, but uh, the questions have been deleted. Maybe they're all answered during the course of your talk. Thank you very much, Father. Thank you. A heartfelt gratitude for those valuable and thought-provoking words of wisdom, Father. Thank you once again. Now I hand over the paper presentation session to Dr. Sidney Shirley, Associate Professor Dr. Evangeline Jenny, Assistant Professor, and Ms. Jessney Evangeline, who's a research scholar, Department of English, Scott Christian College. Over to you, Shri. Thank you very much, Susan. Dear friends, as a coordinator of the webinar, may I remind the presenters that a maximum of seven minutes will be given to each presentation and not eight minutes. I have a great pleasure in welcoming Dr. Je Evangeline Jemmy and Ms. Jessney Evangeline and all the presenters. Over to Dr. Jemmy. Good evening. I am Dr. Evangeline Jemmy. It's time for us to move on to the paper presenters. Let me introduce the first paper presenter, Mrs. Liliana Gonzalez, Manager of Internationalization at the National School of Public Health, University of Antioquia, Colombia. You need to unmute. Yeah, okay. Can you hear me now? Sorry. Uh, okay, good morning. Um, I'm going to talk to you about to, uh, today about the reflections on ethical implications of international student mobility in times of COVID-19. 
from a school of public health in Latin America. This work was carried out by myself and uh, my colleague, Eliana Martinez. And next, please. Next, please. Okay, the School of Public Health is the first public school in Latin America, which was born from international cooperation to educate a critical mass around public health issues for the continent. And it is also proudly an academic unit at Universidad de Antioquia, which is a public university that self fund itself, um, a, Cell funds about 50% uh, of its operation up. Oh. Um, in the past 10 years, the school has allowed for the mobility of over a thousand people, around 30% are students. Um, particularly, uh, the school has co financed mobility uh, of nearly 2,000 people. Uh, with an even distribution between graduate and undergraduate students, and has also welcomed over a, th a hundred students, mostly graduate. Um, so given these important numbers, both the school and the university each year allocate resources to co-finance mobility. Next, please. At the university level, um, at the beginning of the state of emergency or the COVID outbreak, um, 358 students were on mobility, whereas at the school level, we had 29 people in, in mobility from 16 different countries throughout the continent and Europe. Of these 29 people, of these 29 students, 20 were foreign students, four were international grantees, local students, and five were outgoing students. Of those 20 foreign students, 17 were long-term, which in strict sense are not in mobility, but for the office, um, they all require the same support, so we include them. And three were short-term. Next, please. At this point, I want to mention that um, the recommendations we, we make are regarded as endemic. As we, understand that, as we understand that they are complex in nature um, and entail an interaction between a, a, the person, the host country, the home country, other in terms of, of, of public health, we say diseases, but uh, other situations and some um, structural aspects and cultural aspects as well. Next, please. In the past 10 years, we learned that uh, we have common concerns. Public health, higher education, and internationalizations have common concerns in terms of adequate conditions, quality of services, access to opportunities, and inclusion. However, um, well, sorry, at first, uh, in terms of mobility, we understood that what we needed was financial resources to address those challenges. However, now we know after COVID-19 that handing out money is not what we need for the future. What we need is making sure that students do return home safely, um, which presents us to, with two new challenges, co-responsibility and overall well-being. Next, please. This conjoint responsibility is shared by a handful of factors that change and vary according to each student and each particular situation. However, it includes home and host institutions, sponsors, international organizations, special national agencies, ministries, accrediting bodies, and even family and visa migratory agencies. Next, please. In terms of a particular situation, of particular situations in the group of students, um, we of these 29 students, we identify diverse and complex reality, realities during uh, the first stages of, of the outbreak. We were getting terrible news from Europe and the rest of the world. News from here weren't good, 
particularly good. Uh, they, we, were, we are all hoping for a safe return. Uh, we had students stranded in a transit countries. We also had students who, who, who were doing their mobility in cities where there, was, there, there were no cases, which was a good situation. They, they didn't understand why we were so worried. Um, we had students stuck in a host city who were not able and are still not able to get to the, to the international airport. Um, um, we have students who require clearance from the from the sponsor and also the academic requirements and the worry about what's going to happen to my academic process. Once we understood this, next please. Um, once we understood this and after many, many meetings, group meetings and one-on-one -on -one meetings with students, mentors and tutors, we mapped the needs of students in terms of physical and mental health, basic needs, migratory obligations and requirements and safe return and academic concerns. After we had that map of needs that varied from loneliness to visa proceeding to uh, humanitarian flight costs to graduation processes, we, next please, we created or we designed a roadmap of interventions for those, uh, for each of those four aspects. Um, and I'm going to explain them in a minute. This roadmap of interventions took into consideration um, the levels of needs. So we had three groups. We had the group of students that everything is fine and I don't need anything, but I'll let you know. Um, then we had one student uh, who uh, may or may not need help. We're still waiting to see. And then we had a big number of students who were in a very difficult situation in the terms of, please help me, I cannot do it without help. I cannot make it home without help. In this sense, um, the students that are doing okay, they continue to receive follow-up emails where we send them uh, mental health tips and um, um, physical health uh, recommendations, and they receive um, they they were assigned a body uh, uh, a peer so they have someone to relate to more easily we are open 24 7 we have whatsapp lines and skype and everything 24 7 to to listen just to listen to them uh, also we ensured extra funding we paid for uh, uh, medical assistance for 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 a while um we did some hardcore lobby to ensure that visas were issued because of some government's decisions. People, uh, students were kind of stranded in the country without being able to resolve their migratory status. Um, we even paid for the humanitarian airfare for, for one of the students. We allowed for online classes, uh, meetings, dissertations. We covered costs associated with uh, sending mailing diplomas home and every and documents, important documents for the students. Um, sorry, I, I got carried away. So for the first ones, we just continued to send information and, and uh, allow them for, uh, or made the arrangements for them to complete their, their academic work. Um, as I mentioned, for the student who may or may not need the, I'm sorry, could you please move to the next two. See, I got carried away. Next one, please. Yes, that's it. Thank you. And so, um, for the for the students who actually needed help, as I mentioned before, we paid for tickets, um, uh, help with academic arrangements, help with visa proceedings, uh, and provided funding for them. Next, please. In terms of recommendations, just to finish, uh, we recommend to keep the, the mobility process humane. Remember that you're, um, that there is an, uh, a, a person with very sensitive needs at the other end. Make sure that the, those all concerns we mentioned before, inclusion, quality, and all that, are addressed in a way. Um, the leave your comfort zone, be creative, be innovative, uh, be able to or be um, uh, available for students to, to, 
to help you improve. One, I think very important recommendation is to make some shifts in funding. Make sure that um, that um, sponsors don't only fund students who actually move, physically move, but also um, initiatives of internationalization at home and internationalization of the curriculum to make sure that this, um, this um, is more democratic, uh, mobility is more democratic and international opportunities also. Keep the collaborative spirit. At the beginning, we received many many opportunities that were free of charge. Now we receive the same opportunities, but are now being charged and are not particularly cheap. Be a team player. Remember that uh, it's not about giving money to the student to move, but also being responsible for the safe return and create for universities to create a resilient system for international student mobility, which is based on information and evidence, graded response capacity, is able to observe the disturbances, uh, give effective and timely response and recover and reorganize itself. Um, should you have any questions, please next. Should you have any questions or continue this, this um, conversation with me, you may email me, preferably, fnspinternacional at udea.edu.co. That's it for me. I hope I didn't take more than the eight minutes. Thank you. That was a beautiful presentation. Thank you very much. Now we'll move on to the next paper presenter. Uh, Dear presenters, please stick on to time. So now we listen to the second paper presentation by Dr. Simon Ishola, Associate Professor from the Nigerian Baptist Theological Seminary, Nigeria. Thank you once again. It's a great privilege to be part of this international webinar. This paper is on the ethical overview of cultural differences and campus experiences of international students in the Nigerian Baptist Theological Seminary in Obomasho, Nigeria. It's a joint work between myself and another colleague, Dr. Adeshina Abegunde. So right now, he'll be doing the presentation. All right, thank you. Uh, we are speaking on ethical overview of cultural differences and campus experience of international students in Nigeria seminary. Next slide, please. Uh, the truth is that in the 21st century, internationalization of um, academic program is no longer a choice for schools that want to be relevant and uh, student mobility across national and ethnic borders uh, to study abroad are full of challenges full of challenges uh culture shock due to cultural differences and all that and all that are realities that we find uh students confronting next slide please all right, thank you. The Nigerian Baptist Theological Seminary was established in 1898, and for a very long time now, it has been hosting uh, quite a number of international students uh, from across West Africa, Ghana, Cameroon, Liberia, Cote d'Ivoire, Rwanda, Mozambique, Syria alone, and uh, some students from European countries for exchange of programs. So the MBTS have played quite a number of international students over the years. Next slide, please. All right, next slide. Thank you. Uh, looking at trends in student mobility and their challenges, uh, like the Reverend Father said the other time in his presentation, uh, I self-monitor uh, speculated that by year 2020, we have like 8 million mobile students across the whole world, and that means a lot for the, the academic community globally. Uh, all the same challenges are there. Like the last speaker, I've talked about quite a number of challenges from visa and all that and all that. Uh, cultural challenges also abound and also financial challenges, academic challenges, health, 
and family challenges. So this paper actually is trying to focus on more what are the cultural challenges that students face. Uh, cultural shock due to cultural differences shape campus experience of students. As we're going to see in the paper that um, eventual performance of the student, the total experience, the final analysis of their encounter in foreign nation uh, all uh, can be traced to the cultural uh, ethics of the host uh, country. Next slide, please. Thank you. Uh, this work was done by putting up an online form to get information using closed-ended and open-ended questions to get uh, information from uh, 19 international students. Uh, currently, the school play a host to about 18 of them uh, with their spouses also taking one or two specialized uh, programs. But 19 of them responded. The all the 18 students with one of their spouses uh, responded and we were able to get quite a number of um, useful information from them. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, thank you. Uh, the findings here actually show that um, uh, a, the, about 57.9% uh, of the respondents are in Nigeria BTS here for their postgraduate studies. And that means that uh, the basic education uh, 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 studies are available in their own countries, but they actually come uh, to, it, it, I mean, just the general thing that we find everywhere that most mobile students actually location for advanced uh, studies and postgraduate uh, uh, programs. Looking at the age and all that, the age range and adults, uh, some of them are actually middle adults who have actually uh, possibly exhausted what is available inside the environment for better uh, educational provision. Uh, next slide, please. Next slide. Hello. Okay, thank you. I'm uh, looking at cultural differences. Uh, uh, have to do with manners of greetings. You know, this is Africa. You know, manners of greetings and uh, food, diet, um, sometimes clothing, sometimes uh, quite a number of things that have to do with basic uh, human. Yes, even though with the differences, there are so many similarities uh, when it comes to communal lifestyle, sharing, dignity of marriage, uh, solidarity, hospitality. Uh, home, uh, host culture can bond together. The slide we have now actually uh, shows how many of the students, you know, have experienced quite a number of challenges. 78.9% of them said they felt like quitting and going back home, and that is huge and significant for institutions to take note. And 78.9% uh, of them said they have faced financial challenges, as some of the speakers have actually uh, made that point clear to us. 94.8% of them felt they have been judged wrongly by the host culture. And that happens when people don't understand the cultural background of the foreign student and they kind of judge them before they understand them. 78.9% felt anxious about their study, whether they will finish successfully or not. And 94.7% have language difficulty. All of these challenges are banned in literature. And then, um, you know, 84.2% uh, of them have felt dissatisfied and isolated at one point or the other. And 63.2% have experienced induced homophily, you know, they felt like withdrawing themselves from the other students into the carcass of the people they are from the same cultural backgrounds. At the same time, we find out the coping mechanisms of the student, and one of it has to do with the fellowship they have on campus, like the fellowship for international students, where they get to meet and share their common challenges and concern. It has been found to be very helpful. Next slide. The ethical implication, uh, you know, a quick review of the findings, you know, reveal that cultural shock is a global phenomenon because of proximity of cultural uh, groups, whether from one neighboring country to another, or you have to travel very far, like from the south to the north and all that. So the academic community must embody the values of the institutions through conscious shift in perspective, 
attitudes and practices. You know, there will be a time when the school is just in monocultural, so to say, and gradually they get to internationalize their programs. There must be that gradual shift in mindset and all that to be able to accommodate foreigners to the next slide. Uh, there are implications for students too. Students should build interest in their host culture and resilience, you know, for challenges they will confront. And uh, they should learn to forgive. I've discovered, we also discovered that unforgiveness, as simple as it looks, can affect the psychology of the students in receiving from the lecturers and learning uh, properly. Uh, one or two persons, you know, misbehavior in the community is not enough to actually generalize what the host culture look like. And the last slide. Thank you. In conclusion, cultural and cultural elements differs from one ethnic group to another. So there are differences and differences to culture shock, tensions, you know, sometimes arises and all that. We can affect the teaching learning process. So the campus experience with international students is actually a complex interplay between the ethics imbibed by the host culture and also that of the students themselves. Thank you. God bless. So that was the paper. We want to appreciate you for paying attention and for listening. If there are questions, we'll be available to respond to those questions. Thank you. That was a nice presentation. Thank you very much, Dr. Simon Ishola. Now it's time to listen to the third paper presentation of the day from Mrs. Diane Permata Tangyangsari, researcher at the Ganesha Kalpatru Satya, Indonesia. Okay, thank you. Uh, my, the title of my presentation is Ethical Overview of Cultural Differences to Avoid shock, Culture Shock of International Students. Next slide, please. I would like to introduce, uh, I would like to introduction, what is culture is what humans, human learns as a society's members. Culture consists of everything which is learned from normative patterns, behavior, includes the way of thinking, feeling, and acting. The formulation of culture can be interpreted as all works, tastes, and creations of humans that are needed to control the environment. Those strength and resources can be served for the needs of society. Processes of social and cultural change. This is the time that the feeling that covers human soul and that is social rules and values needed to regulate social problems in a broad sense. This work, taste, and creations ultimately form values and rules, although they are always vulnerable to change, either due to internal dynamic and energy or diversion and acculturation. Sorry, next, uh, next slide, please. The level of change in these values and rules depends on the response pattern of a, of a community group to dynamics. This, the discourse of value and rules cannot ignore the presence of ethical and moral concepts that have a normative function. The process of humans in a, in a certain community group, such as higher education institution, is only considered culture if their presence is in line with universal ethical and moral concepts. Next slide, please. Ethics central roles in microsocial perspective. Uh, this is the theory of Philip Smith, cultural theory and introduction. There are several handles in exploring micro perspective, including the following. Based to this relationship or encounter in everyday social life, creative, intellectual, and broad-minded actors. Social order emerge as a result of the abilities of actors who can manage every relationship between the two countries so that they can be predicted successful and understandable. And also to understand how society works, a methodology is needed that uh, can capture the definition of the situation. Next slide, please. Next slide, please. 
adjustment to change, uh, there are the theory, there is the theory mentioned as AGIL. This is a Tarkov Parson theory. Actually, uh, I put this from the social system and toward a general theory of action. Uh, A, the meaning is adaptation, is a way of adapting to the material work and fulfilling materials needs to survive. For example, like clothing, food, and shelter. Economic is very important in this subsystem. And then the second G, goal attainment, is the achievement of goals. The subsystem deals with the results of products or outputs of the system and leadership. And leadership politics is the commander of the subsystem. And then I, integration, is the unification of the subsystem with regard to maintaining order legal system and institution or communities fighting for social order are included in this group. And then L, latent pattern maintaining, maintenance and tension management refers to the whole society to have clear guidelines and a set objectives for action. The institution in the subsystem are tasked with, pro with producing culture values, maintaining solidarity and adjusting values. Places of worship, schools, and families are included in this subsystem. Next slide, please. Culture shock understanding. Culture shock occurs because of the inequality of use between cultures with one another, so that make, making a new culture that comes to another culture experience loss of hope or anticipation of similarities. Concussion culture can be also interpreted as a situation where someone does not know the habit social from the new culture so that an individual cannot display behavior in accordance with the rules in the new environment. In how to communicate and the lack of understanding in culture is also a one of the triggers for a culture shock in an individual who has uh, just moved to a new area. A culture shock that social creatures rarely uh, realize is a culture shock in language, which language is very important in communication to establish relationship with other people. For example, like a speech, the difference to speech, pronunciation, intonation, and so on. Okay, next slide, please. Living values to overcome culture, culture shock. Uh, there are three, uh, sorry, there are three that can uh, mention as dimension. Uh, mentioned as ABC theory. The A is effective. Uh, feeling and emotion can be positive or even negative, where individuals experience confusion and feel overwhelmed uh, because they come to an environment that is not understood from the start. And then the B is behavior, understanding culture and developing social skills for new cultures. And then the third is cognitive, Changes in individual perception of ethnic identification uh, and value due to cultural context, as well as the inevitable loss of things that are considered true by individuals. Uh, next slide, please. I come. Uh, I jump to a con con conclusion. Culture shock can be experienced by anyone in this world because basically, a human being always feels insecure and uncomfortable. Uh, with the new environment of the new experience. And then the second, existence of international students is a process of change that in the same time, uh, this is a lesson for a local educational, educational institution. And then the third is culture of shock can be overcome together when coexistence uh, can be well established. It should be realized that every individual uh, needs to be treated properly. Then the fourth, when ethics, social norms, when ethics, social norms, and values are created harmoniously in people's life, adjustment is possible. Rejection may be present uh, when difference arises, but with the presence of ethics and a sense of social responsibility, it is possible to have to have harmonious uh, behavior that respect one another. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mrs. Diane Permata Tangyang Seri, for the motivating presentation. Now over to Ms. Jessney Evangelin. Good evening. 
I'm J. Jasmi Ivansalam. Let us listen to the fourth paper of the day. I now invite Mr. Sam Tharun, a graduate student from Monash University, Malaysia, to pre present his paper. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Ms. Jasmi. Um, okay. Let's just start it. Okay. A very good evening to my panelists, my fellow presenters, the speakers, and attendees. My name is Tarun, and in today's presentation, I would like to give you a brief overview of my paper, which provides an empirical view of ethical conflicts that are faced by students who pursue their tertiary education outside their home country. Uh, before I go into the content of my presentation, I just wanted to give you a brief introduction to who I am. I was born and brought up in Chennai, India, and I completed my schooling in uh, Chennai itself. I then went to Malaysia, uh, to Monash University to pursue my mechatronics engineering and spent about two years doing um, research work after that. And I'm currently pursuing a master's in international business. Most of the views that I've expressed in the presentation are you know, informed from personal experiences that I've felt being an international student and also interacting with the international student community in Malaysia. So people and their cultural identities, they evolve with time and because of which several traditionalist societies face a battle for the soul of the nation. Uh, this leads to the rise of questions such as is there even an inherent need to preserve cultural identities or do we need to adopt a more unified global identity? Cultures, customs and traditions have had deep rooted significance in um, various, uh, have deep rooted significance for people. And um, sometimes without uh, a deeper understanding of the origins of these customs and traditions, people find it difficult to accept cultural idiosyncrasies, even if uh, they were born into it. And actually a, a very good example is if some of you may have watched uh, My Big Fat Greek Wedding, um, it sort of exposes what happens when two cultures that have never interacted with each other uh, come into contact for the very first time. Now, um, why does this trend exist of uh, internationalization and um, students pursuing education outside? Uh, firstly, globalization has resulted in the development of technologies bringing everyone closer together from various uh, socioeconomic backgrounds and skill sets. Um, this very webinar is a very good example of it, bringing scholars from all over the globe despite global restrictions. Secondly, to tackle large-scale global problems like climate change and socioeconomic injustice, um, we need a more holistic approach that, um, has, that is informed from a broad cultural perspective to implement strategies that can help solve the problem at hand. And thirdly, and I believe this is especially true in countries like India, which is highly competitive, students and working professionals are looking to find unique identifiers through international experiences. Now, um, this is actually a tool that's uh, used in international management studies, uh, Hofstede's cultural dimensions to understand how cultures might react to new environments and new markets. Uh, I'm sort of using that here to ex explain how uh, certain cultures, when they ex exist on the uh, two ends of the index can lead to conflicts. Uh, a person's ethical values, they are strongly influenced by their upbringing and their home culture. Uh, and due to this, trying to better understand a person's culture helps to identify potential pain points of the conflicts that can arise between these two cultures. Armed with the knowledge of a foreign culture can greatly minimize the conflicts that can arise from misunderstandings and differences of opinion. So am I right or wrong? This is probably one of the biggest questions students who go abroad for the very first time ask themselves when they are faced with uh, conflicting situations. Um, when exposed to new cultures without the necessary tools to understand a foreign environment, a student is faced with this inner conflict. Uh, this need to justify oneself is born from the perspective of uh, viewing the world as black and white primarily. However, I believe that we live in a world that is many shades of gray. Context and intent play a crucial role in providing relevant information. Some of the potential areas of conflict are listed here. So we see conflict in work-life balance, in societal interaction, in professional work expectations, and in relationship development. And 
unity and diversity. Now, this is a concept that my fellow Indians would probably be very familiar with. Um, to a foreigner, Indians may seem as a homogeneous group of people. However, this couldn't be farther from the truth. In India, we speak over 18 official languages and numerous dialects and practice most of the major religions. Unity, unity and diversity is one of the guiding principles of India, which, is, which I believe to be a beautiful ideology that promotes a balanced mixture of individual identity along with unified communal empathy. The main takeaway from this principle is that we need not lose our cultural identity and uniqueness when participating and being a part of a much larger community. So, I mean, this is basically an overview of uh, what I've just gone over. So the evolution of culture, people and culture are constantly evolving and westernization has been uh, one of the biggest uh, propagators of this. Um, people's ethical values are born from their cultural upbringing. And one of the biggest questions that students ask themselves when they are faced with new questions is, am I doing the right thing or not? And finally, I believe that um, we need to be unified regardless of how different we may be from each other. And that does not mean we cannot get along. It's just a matter of understanding and taking that extra step to understand somebody else's perspective because their upbringing can be completely different from what we've experienced. And finally, thank you for this opportunity. Um, and I would want to leave you guys with one uh, phrase, ancora in paro. Um, it's an Italian phrase. I'm sure some of you may have heard it before. Um, that really stuck with me when I went and did my studies abroad. It translates to in English as still I am learning. This Italian phrase was uh, adopted by an Australian university as its motto and is now being recited to you by an Indian who went to Malaysia to pursue his higher education. I encourage each and every one of you to be open to new experiences without prejudice, as there will always be a lot we can learn from each other. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Tarun, for your valuable presentation. Let us now listen to the fifth paper presentation by Dr. Sunle Geda, professor at the Shibu Technological University, Philippines. Over to you, madam. Okay, thank you very much. All right, so good uh, evening in the Philippines. It's already evening, so good evening, everyone. I am glad to, uh, to present to you uh, our research titled Students' Experiences in the Communication Program. And together, I am San Legador, and together with me is uh, Dr. Rowan Marie Maxagam Mangompit and Jose Limar Magna. We are from Cebu, Philippines. For almost 25 years now, we are teaching in one of the higher education institutions in the region, Cebu City, and we have known that higher education institutions are expected to produce graduates who are equipped with the skills and competencies needed to be globally competitive. These graduates have to be ready for the job skill sets expected to them. To make decisions on how to better prepare these uh, students, the department where we belong decided to, uh, do, to do a research, particularly on students' learning experiences, because we believe this would be one of the best sources of information to improve quality of student life. Previous studies on student experiences, those done by Abu Bakr et al. in 2018 and Temple et al. in 2016, likewise, Simming et al. and Joseph et al. in 2015, are just a few of the related literature uh, that provide data for improvement in curriculum, teaching, and learning strategies, resources, and non-academic related matters, all of which affect student learning experience. So the team decided to look into the learning experiences of the communications graduating students because these were the pioneering batch and any information collected from them about their learning experiences would be a great source of data for the department. Next slide, please. So this study used uh, as a framework, Collins and Stess in 2015, categories of learning experiences specifically, including quality of lectures, uh, discussions, problem solving and applying knowledge in practice, experiential learning and social climate. So when you say quality lectures, this range from the application of information technology uh, to the content of the subject matter and teachers clear explanations of theories and concepts. Discussions here in, refer to exchanges of opinions and ideas between students and teacher, then problem solving and applying knowledge in practice have something to do, has something to do rather with the application of theories in practice, while experiential learning emphasizes students' learning activities which are acquired outside of the classroom and social climate has something to do with 
the relationship with soft skills. Next slide, please. So this re research uh, answers the following questions, two questions we have. First, what students' learning experiences were shared by the communication students using the framework of Colin and Stez? And the second one is aside from these uh, identified uh, category, learning experience categories, what other themes may have surfaced uh, from the students uh, sharing in the interview? So next slide, please. So this study made use of a qualitative exploratory research design and has interviewed 38 graduating communication students. For the data collection instrument, we made use of the semi-structured interview guide that asked for the best and worst learning experiences of the students. Uh, likewise, we used for data analysis, the framework of Colin and Steph, as mentioned earlier. Then for the ethical consideration, of course, we uh, sought uh, consent from the participants and we assured them that there were no identifying markers uh, that will be reflected in the paper while we go through the, the answers. They were further uh, assured that uh, any information would be uh, kept confidential in terms of their identity and that uh, any time that they would wish to discontinue or withdraw from the project, they could do so. Then uh, when the data were gathered, they were transcribed, organized, coded, and categorized using the framework. Next slide, please, for the results of discussion. So you would see here in the slide that the experiences of the students were categorized into two kinds. We have the best uh, and the worst experiences. And you may see that amongst the five uh, learning experience categories, experiential learning and social climate learning categories topped up, uh, social climate categories topped in the list. Okay, uh, next slide please. Uh, I would show you the some examples of actual excerpts from the interview that were taken from the students uh, for experiential learning and social climate learning. The best experiences of the students were as follows. Example, no? so you would see there in the slide projected. Next slide please. So another, so to answer SO, the research question number two, uh, we have also found uh, newly discovered themes that are outside of the framework that was used. And these were on, uh, related to self, school, and faculty. So you may see in the table that there are, are more counts noted for the worst uh, experiences on the self and, and, and faculty related issues. While for the school related theme, there were occurrences for both uh, best and worst experiences. Next slide, please. So again, here are some sample excerpts of, of students' uh, transcripts. So for the best experience related to self, uh, a student mentioned that uh, the best experience was on learning values and virtues, as these are helpful in, in, in growing. And the worst experience was their experience in waking up early. Another uh, experience, next slide, please. Another, uh, Newly discovered theme is something to do with school related. So here is an example of a best experience and a worst experience as projected in the slide. Next slide, please. Then lastly, for the last theme, and that's something to do with the faculty related, it's a newly discovered theme. You would see here that these are the actual transcripts that were provided by the students. Okay, so next slide, please. So based on the findings, the study would conclude that experiential learning and social climate uh, categories have lingering effect on the students' learning experiences. Uh, these are categories were readily recalled by the students. As learners, uh, they are encouraged to actively participate in the teaching learning process and continue to make sense of their identity in a learning environment. At the same time, higher education institutions must also have equal responsibilities of providing qualified, competent, and nurturing faculty and environment uh, that would be conducive to achieving the target learning outcomes. So to end, uh, I would show you some of the recommendations that our uh, research has uh, provided. Can I have the next slide, please? So here are some of the recommendations you may see here. Students will be given opportunities to be exposed to activities uh, immersion training to enrich their experiential learning. Okay, and then another slide, please. So last four recommendations have something to do with uh, providing uh, some seminars on stress management, time management, so that students will be provided with uh, a lot of assistance so that they will be ha have a, I mean, uh, a helpful uh, stay in the university. 
uh, in terms of South School and faculty. So last slide, please. That's about it, ladies and gentlemen. So that ends my presentation. And let me leave you with this uh, thought to ponder. Learning is a treasure that will follow its owner everywhere. Thank you very much and good evening. Thank you very much, Dr. Sandley, for your insightful and practical presentation. It's time to listen to the last paper presentation of the day. I now invite Mr. Okumo Anthony Okiambo, PhD research scholar from the Catholic University of Eastern Africa, Kenya. Over to you, sir. Good afternoon, everybody. This is Okumo Anthony Odiambo from Kenya. I'll be presenting a paper on Ubuntu as the praxis of intercultural dialogue in the wake of COVID-19 pandemic. And uh, just an apology. Currently, we are doing uh, an outreach program and uh, my area, we have an issue with internet connectivity and electricity. So you will not be able to find my PowerPoint presentation, but in future, I'm going to send it. So coming to Ubuntu, Ubuntu is a term that was, Ubuntu is a term that was coined during the African struggle for independence. And uh, it was majorly a humanitarian philosophy. It comes from a larger African tribe known as Bantu. And uh, it means, or it depicts a moral attribute of a person who is known in the Bantu languages as Mutu or Muntu. An aspect of African traditional philosophy, Ubuntu, prides in the idea that the benefits of the burden of the community must be shared in such a way that no one is prejudiced. Rather, everything is done and put in the interest of the community ahead of the interest of the individual. Ubuntu is the correct behavior, but correct in the sense that it it defines a person's relation with other people. Ubuntu refers to behaving well towards others as acting in ways that benefits the community. It is a term that was majorly used in the South African region and was coiled by the former South African icon, Nelson Mandela, and uh, retired Archbishop Desmond Tutu. It is a philosophy that they used to unite the country after the apartheid seriously hit South Africa. As most of us know that Nelson Mandela spent 70, 27 years in prison. And during the time of his release, when he became the president, he decided to use the term Ubuntu to unite South Africans together. And that is the philosophy that mostly is used in Africa to represent African humanism. In the past, we've had global animosity based on ethnicity, homicides, xenophobia, religious strife, sex orientation, and others. Every day when we listen to the news or when we watch news, we hear of very many sad stories that they go against humanity of people maybe killing themselves, people killing their loved ones, or not respecting humanity at all. And so I thought that Ubuntu is a philosophy that could be used to respond to most of these animosities that we are facing as a globe. We have a global quest for interculturation. Interculturation in this sense is a powerful cause which plays a major part in interpersonal and professional relations. Interculturation is derived from Latin words inter, which means between, and culturel, 
which means culture. Therefore, it is the sum of all relations and interactions between different cultures through meetings and the debates. This presumes intercultural exchange founded on dialogue, mutual res respect, and the desire to preserve the cultural identity of each one. Interculturation is not multiculturation, which is several cultures living together without any mutual sharing or assimilation. It is different from acculturation, which infers a modification of the culture of group of persons under the influence of another culture. It is the opposite of pluralism, a system whereby different ways of thinking are accepted so that people remain as individuals with no connection in between them. Corona pandemic has torn the globe apart because it has pushed us to our very extremes. We've had people losing loved ones. We've had people dying because of the pandemic. And so during this pandemic, we realized that even in the struggle of people, we were still able to come together to help even the least people, talking about those who lost their jobs, families that could not provide themselves. Like in my country, Kenya, we've seen people and foundations, churches coming together to pool resources and to help those who were not able to make end meet, ends meet. And therefore, I propose Ubuntu philosophy or Ubuntu ethics as a philosophy that can help in addressing the problems that we have faced and uh, it can help in uniting the globe together, being that now we are talking about the global village. Thank you. That was a fruitful observation and presentation, sir. Thank you very much for your presentation. Over to Dr. J. Binaharlal. Sir, kindly unmute your mic. Yes, uh, dear friends, that wraps up our first day of the international webinar, International Student Mobility and its Implications mm. on Ethics. Now, may I hand over the floor to Dr. Sidney Shirley. Thank you, sir. On behalf of the Department of English and Center for Research, Scott Christian College, Globe Ethics Net India and the Journal of Dharma, I would like to thank you all for finding time in your busy schedules to join us here today. Our special gratitude to all the speakers of the day for their multidimensional points of view and observations. Our special thanks to all the paper presenters of today. We gratefully remember all the participants from different parts of the globe for their precious time and patient listening. I kindly request all of you to join again tomorrow from 2 p.m. IST. Have a good evening. See you all tomorrow. God bless you.